for the weather in Palmdale today, August 16th, 1956, warm with a high of 95. This afternoon, a moderate chance of rockets falling from the sky. If you're in the Placerita Canyon area, you'll experience burning cars, shattered homes, fire, explosions, and destruction. For everyone else, it's a beautiful day. That afternoon in the high summer of 1956, at about 1.30, Bernice Kempton and her son Larry were racing across the desert east of Palmdale in their new station wagon when they came under fire from above. Rockets suddenly plunged down from the clear sky, peppering the car with shrapnel. The front tyres burst, the windscreen shattered. Bernice struggled to control the wagon, finally wrestling it to a stop in a cloud of dust and smoke. Thankfully, Bernice and Larry were unharmed in the unexpected airstrike. But they were just a few of the victims. As night fell, a large area of Southern California was still burning, the result of a remarkable dogfight in the skies above. Despite its apocalyptic ending, the day had started very normally at Point Mugu Air Station on the California coast. As the sun settled above the horizon, a handful of mechanics prepared a battered old Grumman F6F Hellcat for its final flight. The old warbird had spent its first years roaring off carriers in the Pacific. In its prime, it had been one of the best fighter aircraft in the world, a six-gun brute tasked with wresting air superiority over a vast ocean from the Imperial Japanese Mitsubishi Zeros. More than 12,000 were built in a two-year production run that started in 1943. Now its fighting days were over and it had just one more sacrifice to give to the country that built it. Painted high visibility red and fitted with a remote control system in place of a human pilot, the Hellcat was to end its days today as a range target for a Navy surface-to-air missile test. I like to think that the ground crew still experienced a few pangs of sentiment as they started the double WASP engine. Even though they had already sent over a thousand of these veterans off to die over the previous five or so years. Drones converted from obsolete piston-engined aircraft had actually been a feature of US Navy warfighting since 1942. Under a program called Project Option, 50 TDR-1 suicide drones were built and sent out against targets. The results were quite impressive, with the drones hitting 29 of the 46 targets they had been aimed at. But total US dominance in the air by that point meant the project stalled until the Korean War when it was reactivated. Surplus Hellcats were fitted with radio control apparatus and TV sender units, and loaded up with a 2,000 pound bomb were sent off to high value targets like railroad bridges as rudimentary cruise missiles. This effort was less successful and few if any targets were hit. With advances being made in purpose-built guided missiles, the Navy decided to cut its losses on the suicide drone program. Instead, they used the aircraft as targets for those missiles, controlled from the ground by radio. It was this totally normal mission that was underway at Point Mugu on the morning of 16th of August 1956. Under the guidance of its mothership, a Grumman TBF Avenger piloted that day by Lieutenant Commander J.J. Karofsky, the Hellcat taxied and took off, heading out to sea. But as it tucked up its wheels and began to climb at full power, something went awry. For the first time in over a thousand launches, the Hellcat refused to respond to commands, and, more worryingly, started a gentle turn east towards the shore. Despite the reliability of the drones up to this point, contingencies had been made. The late model Avenger carried two light barrel 50 caliber machine guns and 200 rounds of ammunition. Karofsky, an experienced aviator, brought the Avenger around and tried to line up for a shot. But the Avenger was the heaviest single-engined aircraft of the Second World War, and this one was loaded with radio equipment and a crew. To make matters even harder, his instructions were to fire a only over water to protect the public. The Hellcat ex rapidly accelerated as the big 50s hammered away and all of Karofsky's shots missed. It was like trying to grab the brass ring on a merry-go-round, was his later explanation. His was the first of many excuses associated with the Battle of Palmdale. Unaware of the chaos in its wake, the drone flew on, heading now towards the most populated metropolitan area in the United States of America. Although one imagines that it was the call they least wanted to make, the Navy was all out of options. They called the Air Force and asked for help. A few miles inland, a klaxon sounded in the alert hut of Oxnard Air Force Base, interrupting First Lieutenant Hans Einstein's post-lunch cigarette. He threw the barely-touched tab into the dust and ran out onto the apron. Parked there in the hot California sun were two silver and red F-89D Scorpions, the most advanced fighter aircraft in the world. Within three minutes, he and his wingman Dick Hurleyman were rocketing into the air and turning to intercept the errant Hellcat. The Scorpion is one of many now mostly forgotten aircraft that evolved in the primordial soup of post-war jet development. It emerged from the need to replace the Air Force's P-61 Black Widow night fighter. This was a pretty tough ask because the Black Widow was a prince amongst fighters. 
Although ugly, slow, and pretty massive for a pursuit-class aircraft, the P-61 boasted the highest kill ratio of any fighter deployed during the Second World War. This was because the Black Widow had a very special trick. It was one of the first fighters to carry a radar aloft and could therefore spot enemy aircraft in the dead of night. Since they couldn't see it in return, the Black Widow could attack with impunity. By the end of the war, though, it was apparent that the Black Widow's lack of speed was becoming a problem. In attempted interceptions of ME-262 jet fighters, the latter had simply proved too fast for the P-61 to get into a firing position. The Air Force specification therefore insisted on a top speed of at least 530 miles an hour for its new all-weather interceptor, essentially mandating that jet propulsion be used. It should also be noted that although the Black Widow had proved effective against fighters, the F-89's designated role was to intercept nuclear-armed bombers rather than to engage other fighters. The resulting Scorpion was the F-35 of its day. Rather than focusing on raw kinetic performance, the F-89 intended to win its battles by being radically more aware of its surroundings and therefore able to strike before the enemy knew what was happening. Unlike the F-35, it was very complicated to design and deploy as it required the convergence of a number of cutting-edge technologies in one package. Like the F-35, it also sacrificed dynamic performance to gain those advantages in situational awareness. In an age of sweat-wing fighters, the F-89 was very conventional, a straight-wing monoplane with two after-burning turbojet engines. The Scorpion's electronic advantage came from a state-of-the-art X-band ANAPG-40 fire control radar tied to a Hughes E6 fire control computer mounted in the nose. All of this was controlled by an APA-84 gunnery computer that automatically fired the weapons when the optimal position, as indicated by the E6, was reached. I don't want you to take away the idea, though, that these were anything like the computers on a modern fighter. These were mainly analog systems. The first the airborne digital computer would actually fly a few years later on the f 89 successor, the F-102 Delta Dart. When the F-89 was originally conceived, the intention was to arm it with the Hughes Falcon air-to-air missile. But the development of these weapons encountered endless technical challenges and a more low-tech solution was selected for the mass-produced Scorpion. That weapon was the folding fin aircraft rocket. The Scorpion had 104 of these in wingtip pods. A few early models of the F-89 had actually been armed with 20mm cannons in the nose, but these were replaced with the rockets as soon as feasible to allow the fitment of a more advanced fire control system and the rockets. The 20mm was regarded as unfavourable for attacking Soviet bombers as these were armed with defensive 23mm cannon mounts. Rockets have increased range and substantially greater hitting power. Einstein and Hurleyman were about to test that theory in anger. At this point, with the Scorpions in the air, the situation seemed mostly under control. Point Mugu had the Hellcat spotted on its radar and was nervously following it as, as it swept towards the east. Korovsky and the Avenger still had it in sight, following it to warn other aircraft away. At 30,000 feet, with Hurleyman tight on his wing, Einstein saw the Hellcat. It was in a turn, chugging near its maximum altitude, fighting to stay aloft in the thin air. The Hellcat might stall at any time and spin into the populated area below. Fortunately, the wind was now carrying it in the general direction of the desert area north of Los Angeles. In the Scorpion's rear seats, the radar observers, Lieutenants Clennon D. Murray and Walter Hale, had detected the slow-moving drone. But as they activated the E-6 fire control system, a problem presented itself. The Scorpion's fire control system offered two main targeting modes. The pilot can engage from a position on a bomber's 6 o'clock position or from perpendicular to its flight path. The E6 in principle also permitted a third mode for collision course intercepts, with the Scorpion approaching the target from its front quadrant and firing rockets to destroy it as the paths of the two aircraft intersected. This fact wasn't widely promoted as in a more traditional tail chase attack the interceptor would line up behind the target for shots but in a collision course intercept there was effectively only one chance to get it right. That was the other reason why rockets were being used instead of cannons. Although they were notoriously inaccurate it seemed likely that if a salvo was launched against a target the size of a bomber one rocket would hit and that would be enough to take the target down. The problem Einstein and Hurleyman encountered on August the 16th though was that the fire control system was intended to target jet bombers flying at 600 miles an hour. The Hellcat was struggling along at about 180. It was also using the fiendish evasive manoeuvre of a gentle turn. Einstein decided to engage from position crossing the Hellcat's path at 90 degrees, but the ANAPG-84 just couldn't calculate a firing solution and refused to engage. The only option left open to Einstein and Hurleyman was to engage manually. Unfortunately, although through their great belief in the effectiveness of the electronic system, the F-89's designers hadn't fitted any kind of optical sight, even a basic World War II gun sight. One imagines Einstein and Hurleyman began to sweat a little under their oxygen masks. 
They orbited and asked the Navy for instructions. By now, the circling drone had blown eastward to a less populated area. If it continued east, the chances were now small that the inevitable crash would hurt anybody. Conversely, the area above which she now wandered seemed relatively safe one to shoot over and the drone might still turn back to Los Angeles. Should Einstein and Hurleyman assume their rockets would not damage anything in the area below and shoot down the drone while they could, or should they let it run out of fuel and crash? The decision involved a calculated risk, and according to the Air Force it was made both in the air and on the ground. They would shoot down the drone. Einstein and Hurleyman made their passes. The F-89 Scorpion carried the 2.75-inch Mighty Mouse rockets in two large streamlined pods placed at the very end of the wings. The rockets nestled in a honeycomb pattern in each pod with the noses jutting out ahead. There were 52 rockets in each pod and the rockets could be launched in one, two or three salvos. When they were launched, vents around the rear of the rocket pack would divert the exhaust from the fuel tank behind it. Launch, the launch of the rockets was therefore spectacular to watch. Kurovsky must have experienced a great show. Einstein, given what was considered a safe bearing, banked towards the turning target. But now yet another problem presented. Although aerodynamically conventional, the, the Scorpion had slim wings of relatively limited area. Its stall speed was significantly higher than the Hellcats. The Scorpion was a big fighter too. It weighed almost 20 tons. Maintaining control and attempting rocketry by eye under these conditions was extremely challenging. The drone, being unarmed, presented a target which he could approach more closely than a Soviet bomber, but there was still the danger of overrunning it, of colliding with it, or even passing through the debris of the explosion as he, as he, when he successfully hit it. The Hellcat quickly grew in size in his windscreen. Einstein broke off his run and banked to watch Hurleyman. Heinz Einstein and Dick Hurleyman made ten passes each at the battered Hellcat. Each broke off seven runs because the bearings chosen were too awkward, or because there might be danger below, or just because the run didn't feel right. Each made three firing runs. On the last, Hurleyman claimed a hit on the Hellcat's wing. Einstein claimed a pro possible hit on his belly tank. Each fired 104 rockets at the drone. When the last run had been complete, the Hellcat, apparently unscathed, thrashed defiantly on. Einstein and Hurleyman circled helplessly. 30,000 feet below, Unknown to the men aloft, all hell began to break loose. At two o'clock in the afternoon, two hours and 25 minutes after its impromptu machine uprising, the tired but triumphant Hellcat coughed, spluttered, and ran out of fuel. Wearily, it began to spin. It crashed in the desert, 12 miles east of Palmdale, California, pulling down three California Edison power lines as a last gesture. And then it burned. Einstein and Hurleyman roared back to Oxnard, I imagine there was a pointed silence in those two cockpits. The ignominious result of the Battle of Palmdale would have remained buried in the historical records of the drone testing program and tall tales in the ready room, were it not for the fact that the area Einstein and Hurleyman had been flying over wasn't as unpopulated as appeared from 30,000 feet. 104 2.75 inch rockets, each carrying a 2.7 kilogram high explosive warhead, had just landed on the area. Aside from the Kempton's narrow escape, oil sumps were blown up, houses damaged, and a truck was hit in the engine block by a rocket, which fortunately failed to detonate. A chain of brush fires 25 miles long was ignited, requiring firefighters from across the state to fight it. Roads were blocked. Trains were stopped. There was no way of brushing this under the proverbial carpet. A sensible explanation was required. So the Air Force gave one. The drone was flying too slowly to hit, which was ridiculous and unsporting. And anyway, we did hit it once, probably twice, so there. They would have been furious about the Chinese balloon. Inwardly, the military saw no reason to change their course. In fact, the Battle of Palmdale reinforced their strategy. The challenges its two pilots had in hitting a slow-moving target with unguided weapons validated their dogma. The gun was dead. The guided missile was the future. It offered greater range, greater accuracy, and greater hitting power. What was therefore needed was more money, more technology, greater ambition and greater commitment. A decade later, this dogma would meet reality in the skies over North Vietnam. More immediately, development of the F-89 continued. Later in 1956, a new version of the Scorpion entered service, which reduced the capacity of the rocket pods to 42 rounds total and added six Gar-1 Falcon air-to-air -air missiles queued by an upgraded fire control system. Some would correctly argue this did little to increase accuracy given the efficacy of the Falcon, but in any case it was a sign of things to come. Finally, in 1957, yet another version took flight. This J model did away with the wingtip pods entirely in lieu of wingtip tanks, and in exchange they added two pylons for the infamous MB-1 Genie unguided nuclear rocket. 
350 D model scorpions were modified to this standard. One of them actually launched an active test round to see if it worked, which it did. The role of the unguided rocket in air-to-air -air combat was not quite over yet. On the 1st of May 1967, a flight of A-4 Skyhawks launched from the USS Bonhomme Richard to attack Kep Airfield north of Hanoi. Part of their F-8 Crusader escort had to divert along the way, leaving the Skyhawks underprotected. Lieutenant Commander Theodore Swartz was leading the flak suppression flight and was about to make a strafing attack on the, on the Kep airfield when his wingman alerted him to a pair of MiG-17 frescoes moving to attack at his 6 o'clock position. Swartz, incidentally a former Crusader pilot, aborted his target run and pulled his aircraft into a defensive high-G barrel roll. The unexpected manoeuvre caused the attacking MiG to overshoot and Swartz slid into his 6 o'clock position. Without time to switch to guns, he fired a salvo of Zuni rockets. The Zuni is the 357 Magnum of aerial rockets. It weighs 36 kilos, more than four times that of the 2.75-inch air folding fin aircraft rocket. There are no probables here. One of the Zunis hit the MiG, which disintegrated in a ball of fire. So maybe that was Einstein and Herleman's problem in 1956. They just needed a bigger rocket. I hope you've enjoyed this video. It was a really fun one to research. If you did, please consider subscribing for more military tactics and strategy. If you've got further information on the Battle of Palmdale, or in particular on the fire control systems of the F-89 and similar aircraft, please do leave a comment. I get a lot of great insights from you guys and I really appreciate you. Thanks a lot for watching.